Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. As you probably know by now, many years ago I started the biggest reading project that I have ever attempted and probably the biggest one that I will ever attempt. I decided to read at least one book by every winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. It took me 13 years to complete that project. And it was that project, that idea, that led me to many amazing authors, one of whom is the Finnish novelist, Franz Emil Sillampere. Now, back then, in those days, I read his most famous novel, The Maid Celia, and I really, really liked it, but for many years what I wanted to do was to read the book that some people have called his masterpiece, and that is People in the Summer Night. Now, many years later, I have finally read it, and I loved it, and I want to share my impressions on this book with you. The first thing that I wanted to do uh, when talking about Silampea is to give you a little bit of background about him. Because, as you know, there are a handful of Nobel laureates that not many people have read. Uh, actually, if you have read Silampea, please let me know. Uh, you, you have a very special place in my heart, and, I don't know, we need to get coffee or something, because he really is one of those, you know? Uh, he was born in 1888 in a farm. Uh, he was the son of a farmer, actually. So he was born in this rural area. And that is the type of setting that he would explore throughout his uh, literary career. The family's original name was actually Henriksson, which is a little bit easier for me to pronounce, at least. But they decided to change it to Silampe, which means bridge head. And one of the reasons why they changed the name is because they actually lived uh, near a bridge. So it had to do with the location where the farm was, where they lived. Uh, Silampea went to college, okay, where he studied um, primarily biology and chemistry, so the hard sciences, uh, the topics that I am not particularly very good at, so I thought that that was interesting. But at the age of 25, he dropped out of school and he went back home to find his parents, um, as you can imagine, aging and also impoverished, okay? He had always been a reader, and it was at that point that he decided to start writing. And he was actually very fortunate, you know? He uh, began to write, he sent his work out, uh, publishers liked it, they published it. So uh, that's how he became an author. I I'm pretty sure it was, it was a lot more difficult than that, you know? But uh, that's basically the, the bare structure of his story. There were about five novels, four or five novels, in his career that are important, so I wanted to give you a little bit of information on those. His first novel, which is from 1916, is titled Life and Son, and I want you to know that for some of these I am giving you just an approximation of the title in English because not all of them have been translated into English. As a matter of fact, there are only three books by Silampea that are available in English. So, Life and Son from 1916. This is an autobiographical novel, okay, clearly. The protagonist at one point returned to his parents' house. Uh, he gets married also, which is something that uh, Silampea also did when he went back home after college. Uh, the action is not really, you know, it's very slow. And also the characters are not well developed. They seem more like sketches. Um, it seems that when you read this novel that the main character is almost as if the landscape, uh, nature with a capital N, were the main character, you know? This is very important for the novel uh, or the text that we are about to explore in this video, so uh, keep that in mind. The next important work by him is from 1919 and it is titled Meek Heritage. This one is actually available in uh, English and it's about the Finnish Civil War. And one difference between uh, Meek Heritage and Life and Son is that in Meek Heritage you can actually see more of the psychology of the characters. So there's quite a bit more development in that aspect of the narrative. And another important thing about this novel, Meek Heritage, is that it won its author recognition abroad, uh, particularly in Sweden, which would become important, uh, as you know, in the future. After that, we have to go to 1931 for the next important work. He wrote some short stories in, in that interval. And in 1931, it was that he published The Maid Celia, the novel that has been uh, his most famous one throughout the world, really. Now, the title of this novel in the original um, Finnish is Nuorena Nukunut, which means actually fallen asleep 
at a young age, fallen asleep at, uh, while young, or something like that, where, of course, fallen asleep is a euphemism for death. Okay, so dead young would be a, a quick, uh, direct, and maybe even brutal translation of, of that title. Uh, this is a good old-fashioned novel of the land, okay? Uh, there were many Nobel laureates in those early days of the Nobel Prize who wrote these types of novels. You know, Think uh, Growth of the Soil by Knut Hamsun, um, Independent People by Haldor Laxness, The Peasants by uh, Wadiswab Raymond. You know, that kind of novel it is that we are talking about. And The Maid Celia, as the title indicates, is about a woman, right? A young woman, and, and a very good young woman, actually, who in fact uh, represents the nation, right? So that was another common trope of that type of uh, novel. Then it was in 1934 that he published People in the Summer Night. We're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. And in 1939, he uh, finally was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. He had been nominated many times before, I believe actually every single year starting 1931. So it was in 1939 that he won the award. And let me read you the citation. So uh, he received the Nobel Prize for Literature, and this is quote, for his deep understanding of his country's peasantry and the exquisite art with which he has portrayed their way of life and their relationship with nature. And at least here where I'm reading it, nature is capitalized. That is important. So, after the Nobel Prize, there is one book uh, that is considered to be important. It's from 1945, and it is titled The Beauty and Misery of Life. This one also, I'm giving you an approximation of the title because it is not available in English. And the interesting thing about it is that it is about an author, about a writer, uh, a father and a husband too, who is in love with a woman who is not uh, his wife. So, that's another important work. So now that we have looked at uh, some details from his life and his work, we can actually uh, look at the text uh, here, People in the Summer Night. It is roughly 150 pages, and it consists of 48 chapters that are very brief. Uh, what do I mean by very brief? Um, the longest ones have six pages. Most of them have two pages three pages, something like that. And there were a couple of them that were only one page long, and one of them was even half a page long. So just to give you an idea how the, the story or the narration is uh, divided into chapters. So the first thing I noticed as I read People in the Summer Night were the vivid and beautiful descriptions of nature. The landscapes, the flowers, even the night, as we would expect from the, from the title of this, right? So that was the, the first thing that caught my attention. And then after that, I realized that I was being introduced to a series of characters, right? And my first question, as I kept reading, right? When you get to page 20, you're like, okay, which one of them? Like, who is going to be the protagonist here, right? Uh, I read about their everyday lives. For instance, a uh, cow uh, got sick, you know, a mare escaped. So the kind of thing that people in a rural area would have to deal with on a daily basis, you know, this was uh, just uh, life, right? Pure and uh, simple. Pure and simple, it doesn't mean easy, okay? Simple and easy are two very different things, but it is presented in a very simple way. And it, it seemed to me that nature, nature with a capital N, was uh, just as important as the characters, if not more so, right? So when I got to page 50, I was wondering, is there going to be a protagonist at all? Maybe that, this is one of those cases where we do not have a protagonist or a main character in the uh, story. Maybe the protagonist is the actual place, right? The habitat, which includes the people uh, li living in it. And what about plot? You know, these are the questions that I was asking myself. What about plot? Well, uh, I think that plot, really, by, by its very notion, the very notion of plot is, in a way, contrived, and, and even fake, I would say, right? Because there is no plot to life, right? There's no plot to life, at least, uh, unless the plot that we impose on it. I think maybe plot is the result of our desire for order and for structure. You know, it's one of those things that we use in order to make sense of the chaos. If this is true, right, if what I'm saying makes any sense at all, then that would explain why the Maid Celia was more popular than People in the Summer Night, because in the Maid Celia you actually have not only a protagonist, but also a story, right? So you have both of those elements that we, as traditional readers, uh, appreciate. 
most of the time. So I'm on page 50, right? Uh, and, and, and nothing has happened. So I keep telling myself, you know. But then I realized that something important at least had actually happened. It's just that I didn't realize is I didn't give importance to the things that had happened. That's why I was waiting for something major, for, for a kind of wow factor or something like that. But one thing that had happened was that two characters, Helka and Arvid, had met. They had liked each other and they had even kissed, you know. So that was important. It's just that I didn't realize it. And I didn't know a lot about these characters. I felt like I was not familiar with them, but I really liked them and I wanted to learn more about them. So that's how the story got me, you know, involved in this. By the time that I reached uh, page 100, I realized that I wasn't just being presented with uh, random characters, with a random series of characters, but what was happening really was that there were five narrative threads, at least, that the author was interlacing in this text, and that was the structure of People in the Summer Night. This text is, in fact, a kind of tapestry, Okay, where you may have several things happening all at once, but you cannot look at all of them at once at the same time, right? You have to look at one of them at the moment. And as a tapestry, this text is just masterfully woven. Okay, I, I really like the way that he uh, builds this story. Also related to this issue of the tapestry, right, is this. The characters in People in the Summer Night are primarily farmers. But there are also rafters, uh, there's a musician, there's an artist, there's a doctor, there are police officers. So we really have a wide array of types, um, just like in real life, right? Because, as you know, it takes all sorts to make a world, and this book really reflects that. When it comes to themes, right, and topics, it is also like that. It is also like a tapestry, because it encompasses birth, uh, death, happiness, anger, danger, joy, love, everything, you know? And I would say uh, it is a very benign story. That's how I would describe it. When you get to the second third of the text, you're going to realize that something very important happens. There's an event, right, that is central to the story. So even though there might not be exactly what we can call a plot, there's an event that is very important, and that is a murder. It's actually a stabbing. So it's not only a murder, but a very violent type of murder. And even though we have that murder, this is something that struck me about people in the summer night, even though we have that murder, there are no villains really in this story. At least, at least uh, that's how I felt about it. The descriptions here are very vivid, okay? That is something that I, that I really liked. And there are many moments you will find of great poetry, okay? One of those moments is, for instance, on uh, chapter 44, where uh, we are we encounter a wanderer, and I wanted to read you a little paragraph just so you get an idea of the prose that uh, Silampea uh, produces. So this is chapter 44. It would be out of place to say of a wanderer in the still summer night, especially one who is alone, that he is in any way unhappy. If an isolated house, having taken its last inmate, inmate under shelter, is like a mother, then so is the whole expanse of the summer night with its earth and sky. In its embrace, even the most unhappy mortal, at least if he is alone, will always rest in one way or another. To a northerner, his homeland then wears its dearest expression of all. The ground beneath his feet is Mother Earth, from which he has come and to which he will return. And in something like the pale, boundless sky above his head, he hopes his spirit will one day awaken. For a man moving about aimlessly at night, the greatest unhappiness is perhaps if he is not aware of this deliverance from his pain. But then, it is seldom that such a person gives his pain to the spirit of the summer night. So just to give you an idea of the author's prose. Now you might think, because of the fact that there is no protagonist here, and also because this is such a brief text, right, that there is not a lot of psychological depth to it. And yet, there is at least one character, the character of Grandmother, who used to be the mistress of the estate where most of the action takes place. We actually get inside her head. You know, we hear her thoughts. There are a couple of chapters, chapter 39 and chapter 48, right? Chapter 39, we actually hear only about Grandmother looking at the lake, but we really get inside her thoughts, and we hear about her experiences and also about her, just her view of life, right? Her worldview. 
Also, uh, when it comes to the issue of brevity, right, because this is a very brief text, some people might claim that um, people in the summer night is schematic or half-baked, that there is no character development. Personally, I found the structure to be quite refreshing, you know, because there was no story because I didn't have to wonder, okay, what's going to happen to this character? How is the protagonist going to end up? You know, what, what's going to happen to him? I could focus on other things. I could focus on the descriptions, on the style, and also just on the vision, you know, the panorama that, that Silampe was uh, presenting to me. So I really appreciated that change, you know, from the typical approach of the, of the novel or any narrative text that we may have. In this book, I would say that Silampe, at least in this book, okay he does not really spell things out for you he just suggests and he lets you decide what you're going to do with the information that he's giving you and with the text now something interesting here you may have noticed that i have not talked about genre genre is a thing that i usually discuss in towards the beginning of my videos but there's a reason why i have left that for last this time and this is it it was only towards the end of my reading experience that I realized that People in the Summer Night is not actually a novel. It's a novella. Okay? It's a novella about life in a small town, in a small community. This story uh, ends, right? But it doesn't conclude. It ends because every text has to end. There has to be an end to the text, but the story does not really conclude. It keeps echoing in your mind. And that is something typical of the novella as a genre, as I have pointed out before. So I'm sorry if you have heard me say that before, but that is really what the novella does, you know? It continues to echo in our minds. We complete the story ourselves, you know? Now, uh, you may want to focus on something here, because we always do that when we're reading. I feel like sometimes, because we are trained a certain way as readers, we try to hold on to something from the text, to an event, something that happened, right? In this case, you may want to hold on to that murder that happens. You know, you think maybe this is a murder story, it's a mystery, or something like that, and towards the end we're going to find out something more about that, why it happened, for instance. This is not about the murder. You know, it's a very important event and everything, but actually, it's not about the murder. This is about nature. Nature, once again, with a capital N. And if you think about it, before nature, before the grandeur of nature, we are all of us secondary characters. So that's why you don't really have a protagonist in this text, one of the many reasons. There's an introduction to this edition in English by Thomas Warburton, okay? And there's one thing that, that he says in the introduction that I thought really nailed it when it comes to the type of novel that we have here. He said, if Robert Frost had ever written novels, this is kind of what they would have been like. And, and I can say I, I really agree with that, okay? To be perfectly honest with you, I am not a fan of Robert Frost, but uh, if he had written novels and they had been something like this, then that would have been uh, perfectly all right with me. So the bottom line here, I uh, really loved revisiting Silampea after so many years in a completely different type of text. And the traditional reader in me uh, probably prefers The Maid Celia, right? But uh, People in the Summer Night, what it has is a, is a more subtle right, type of structure and approach. So it's really for lovers of the novella. So that's why I liked it very much. I'm not going to tell you which one is better, okay? Uh, I think the two texts have much to offer. So um, if you do decide to read this author, whichever one you go with uh, is going to provide you with, with something wonderful, okay? It's just, it just depends on, on the kind of reader that you are. I would really love to see uh, some new editions of uh, Silampea's work. So if uh, Penguin or NYRB are listening, that, that would be fantastic, okay? New editions, maybe new translations too. Not that there's anything wrong with the old translations of uh, these books. So if you do want to read Silempe, I would say uh, definitely I recommend him. If you like character development, like if character is your thing, then I would suggest that you go for The Maid, uh, Celia. If you like some unconventional structure, then I would say by all means try uh, People in the Summer Night because it really is very satisfying. Do you have any questions, any comments, recommendations? Have you read Silampea? Please let me know so that maybe we can uh, talk about him, because I honestly don't know anybody who has read him, and I enjoyed him immensely. So those were my uh, thoughts, my two cents on People in the Summer Night by Franz Emil Silampea. Thank you so much for stopping by. Have a wonderful day.